Good afternoon. Welcome to Retail Council of Canada's eighth webinar in the Enabling Retail 2016 webinar series, Accessibility Needs on Mental Health. My name is Patrick Rogerson, Manager of Member Programs with Retail Council of Canada. Before we begin, for our webinar today, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them on the right-hand side of WebEx using the question and answer pane or additionally the chat feature. For questions post-webinar, please feel free to contact me via the phone and email information at the bottom of your screen. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers. Uh, first, Kashia Alam, Engagement and Education Officer with the Canadian Mental Health Association's Ontario Division. And one of our retail members, Karina Prokopchuk, Corporate Wellness Services Manager with the Beer Store. Ladies, welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. For our agenda, we're going to touch on a number of elements surrounding mental health in the workplace. First, we'll be looking at the definition of what mental health actually is on its own in a positive light, and then we'll be looking at what mental health issues are. Next, we'll be touching on some of the barriers to allowing effective employment of individuals that may have disclosed or may not have disclosed that they possess a mental health condition. Then we'll be touching on some leading practices uh, being provided by the Canadian Mental Health Association with respect to how to overcome the barriers to create accessibility. And then we're going to have a discussion on the beer store's journey in overcoming barriers within their workplace and establishing an environment that promotes mental health. To begin, though, Kasia, uh, again, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. Before we get going, do you want to do a little bit of an introduction just on yourself and the Canadian Mental Health Association for those that may not have, may not have worked with them in the past? Sure. Thank you, Patrick. So, uh, as Patrick mentioned, I work at the Canadian Mental Health Association Ontario Division, and uh, I'm the Engagement and Education Officer here. And uh, very briefly, I wanted to share a little bit more about what we do. So CMHA is a national organization, and it was founded in 1918, and it is actually one of the oldest voluntary organizations in Canada. Each year, CMHA local branches across Canada provide direct mental health services and support to more than 100,000 Canadians. CMHA divisional offices, for example, the Ontario Division, where I'm from, we focus more on mental health policy development and implementation, and uh, we work very closely with uh, our 31 local CMHA branches across Ontario. Excellent. So um, I wanted to dive right into um, how we define mental health. Uh, so at CMHA Ontario, we use the definition of mental health that comes from the Public Health Agency of Canada. We believe that mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual can realize their abilities, cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively and fruitfully. So it's important to remember that we all have mental health just as we all have physical health. So although people often think of mental health as the absence of an illness, it is a lot more than that. Um, so mental health is our capacity to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life. So mental health actually affects all of us. Now, for those that are joining us today on the webinar, we are changing the pace a little bit, and we're going to have a couple polls for those that are attending. So Kashia and I will be just waiting for a moment, and we have queued up our question on the side. And this is just a simple yes or no question for those attending. Please feel free to click on your answer and then click the submit button in the bottom right corner. But our question to the audience today is, have employees within your respective organizations identified themselves as possessing a mental health issue? And we'll give about 30 seconds for the results to come in. But this is always an interesting question that we get into with different retailers. Uh, individuals wanting to disclose, maybe being a little cautious, and employers having maybe a little bit of a standoff approach to do we want to ask that question and how is it best to ask that question? And uh, Kashia, maybe we can talk about, well, with the poll answers are coming in, what is the best way for someone within, say, HR in a retail environment to pose that question or to elicit that information from an employee in a way that wouldn't be discriminative in nature? That's a good question, Patrick, and I can see from an employer perspective why employers would have would 
would be challenged with that. Um, but it's important to remember that under the provincial law, employers are not required to disclose their mental health condition unless the accommodation that is provided by the employer requires uh, disclosure of that information. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about when we touch on barriers, but the reason why we are um, really, uh, we really want to focus on the importance of disclosure if it's needed is because oftentimes employers fear that if they disclose their mental health condition, they will face stigma and discrimination at work, um, or they'll face a disciplinary action. So. No, and, and I agree. Those are some of the concerns that have been raised as well through the conversations I've had in the past. Um, so we'll just be wrapping up the polls now, folks, and take a tally. We're just waiting on a few individuals to finalize their answers. Right now, though, it, the trend looks to be about 80% of the retailers that have joined us today actually have employees disclosing that information. Just jumped up to 81. 19%, it actually keeps going up right now. So the majority is a yes. Uh, the vast majority of retailers are finding that information is being provided. And that, that's a positive thing to see. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you, Patrick. Um, I think that just by the fact that majority are disclosing their mental health condition, it's a positive sign that the organization is very inclusive and supportive of people with mental health conditions. So, Kashi, let's go on to what mental health issues are, because this is a little bit of a different definition than what mental health would be. Yes. So. Uh, mental health issues can be defined as changes in thinking, mood, or behavior. It's usually triggered or aggravated by something, and it's uh, usually accompanied by unhelpful coping pattern. Uh, mental health conditions are associated with significant distress, impaired functioning, and other health problems. So when thinking about mental health issues, a um, few important things to keep in mind. Um, mental illness, as you know, is often called an invisible illness, so there's no way to know if someone has a mental health condition unless they tell you. Um, mental health issues and addictions, the experience of it can differ from person to person and for the same person from day to day. Um, mental health issues, they can be temporary, um, they can last a few weeks, they can be enduring, or they can be episodic in nature. So those are all very important things to keep in mind when we're thinking about the definition of mental health issues. Okay. And uh, now we have a few examples of mental health conditions that uh, you may have all heard of. So some very common ones are depression, anxiety and panic disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, um, concurrent disorders. And Kashri, just for, for my understanding, concurrent disorders, is this taking two of the above mental health conditions and uh, putting them together concurrently for the individual, or is this a specific term? Um, no, you're right, Patrick. So concurrent disorders actually describes a condition in which a person has both a mental illness and a substance use problem. So the term is a general one, and it refers to a wide range of mental illness and addictions. So for example, someone with schizophrenia who abuses cannabis has a concurrent disorder. Um, another example might be someone who suffers from chronic depression and who is also an alcoholic. Okay. So let's go over uh, some of the numbers. So the reality is that mental health is often not recognized as important as our physical health. So we know that one in five Canadians experience mental health condition each year. Mental, mental illness typically account for 30% of short and long-term disability claims, and 70% of disability costs are attributed to mental illness. So if we start by focusing on proper training and education about mental health and mental illness, by implementing proper prevention strategies and providing the right treatment and services for those who need them at the right time, Canada's economy can actually save about $50 billion per year. And again, that's not exclusive to the retail sector. We're talking about all industries at this point. Yes. Okay. So since there's not enough time today to dig deeper into workplace mental health or any specific mental health issues, 
I would recommend everyone to check out our Mental Health Works program. So Mental Health Works is a social enterprise of the Canadian Mental Health Association, and it's delivered through CMAG branches across Canada. Mental Health Works provides capacity building workshops, presentations, and webinars that are person-centered, evidence-based, and it's solution-focused. So through the Mental Health Works program, you can start to build your mental health awareness, you can learn how to respond to challenging situations, and collaborate with colleagues and managers to create a healthier and safer workplace. So you can learn more about Mental Health Works by uh, going to our website, uh, mentalhealthworks.ca. And this brings us to our second poll question. Um, and again, the answers provided here by the attendees are going to be held in confidence. We don't know the individual names that are responding just for everyone's information. But our second question, and you'll see the list of options on the right-hand side, which mental health disorder um, issues or conditions are of specific interest to you as a retailer? And Katria, while we wait on this, I think it's important to maybe we can discuss the vernacular because a number of retailers, myself included, we've, we've changed terms over the years. Um, mental health disorders, again, that was a, a piece of language that I think was used probably five to ten years ago. Is mental health issues the appropriate terminology now, conditions, or is there a right or wrong terminology to use here? Um, you're right, Patrick. Mental health disorder is, um, it is a very outdated term, and um, CMHA Ontario uh, prefers to use terms that um, include mental health issue or mental health condition or mental health illnesses. Um, so it's very important to be careful about the language that we use when we're talking about mental health and mental health issues because we have to be mindful that the language that we use really do and it can contribute to some of the stigma and discrimination around mental health. So we're just getting our poll results now. It looks like the majority of the interest, we're looking at a 77% focus on depression, 81% uh, of respondents, because multiple answers could be selected here, looked at anxiety and panic disorders. Uh, schizophrenia was around 12%, eating disorders about the same. Substance abuse and addiction, we're looking at about 63%, and concurrent disorders just over 30 and then uh, the other category occupying about 12% of our responses here. Mm -hmm. So again, obviously a, a focus, Kashi, on three particular things, depression, anxiety, and panic disorders, and then substance abuse and addiction. Um, concurrent disorders actually is just going up a little bit as well too, so I would say that's the fourth on the list. Are, are these the common ones that are seen by CMHA? Yeah, um, I'm not surprised at all actually by the results of the poll. Um, and not just CMHA, I think uh, industries all across Canada, those three are usually the top three conditions that we usually see, depression, anxiety, and uh, substance abuse and addiction-related disorders. So um, not a big surprise there. Okay, so as we transition over into the barrier side, I have a two-part question for you. What is the biggest barrier around mental health conditions that you see, and how do we help break down those barriers? Yeah, those are really great questions, Patrick. Um, so mental health issues are still misunderstood and it's still feared by many people, despite how common they are. Um, the biggest barrier is that many people with mental health issues face stigma and discrimination, which can in turn affect their ability to secure new employment or maintain their current employment. Um, some of the other common barriers include um, employers' unwillingness to accommodate individuals with mental health conditions, and um, people with mental health conditions might face social exclusion or bullying at work. So in order to break these barriers down, I think it starts with every single one of us educating ourselves about mental health. Once we have accurate information about mental health and mental health conditions, we can start to spread the knowledge advocate for those with mental health conditions who may be victims of stigma and discrimination. 
We can then start to have a ripple effect by creating safe and inclusive work environments that promote mental health for everyone in the workplace. And, and I would agree, the social exclusion and bullying, that can be something that actually increases the likelihood of an individual not to disclose that there is something that they want to identify as an issue, maybe not medically defined, um, but bringing that forward becomes more difficult at that point. The inclusion piece is a, a huge component. But that said, let's go into poll question number three because this is going to start to speak to it a little further. Um, for our audience, and this is a write-in question, folks. You'll see at the bottom of the screen in the uh, submission chat feature, please write out the text that you would like us to address. No personal information for the company, though. Please identify for us what's the greatest barrier that you're facing as a retailer or a grocer with respect to accommodating individuals with mental health issues. And again, just a reminder, this will be in the chat feature as opposed to the question and answer tab at the top of the WebEx screen. And please click submit once you're ready to provide your answer. So just once more, folks, we'll just note, please use the chat feature at the top of the WebEx screen. So two interesting responses so far. First of all, finding suitable positions for individuals with a mental health issue. Um, and again, that can be a concern for many retailers. And uh, Kashi, I think we'll speak to that after the poll, but that could be where there are support groups such as accessibility stakeholders, such as CMHA, um, Ontario Community Living, that could assist at that point in time. Uh, a second point that came through as well if an individual or an organization is not aware of the services, that obviously hamstrings them, but also not being aware of the issues themselves. Um, and that's not to say that an organization may not have put systems in place to elicit that information or provide an open door policy. But again, it's tough when you, when you don't know what to respond to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, um those are actually really good examples of common barriers from an employer's perspective that, uh, that you might be facing. Um, so we can actually move on to the next slide and talk about how we can actually remove some of these barriers. Just before we go on, we just had two more come in that were great answers. Um, sure. Absences that are episodic in nature as a result of a disability and scheduling becoming difficult. And then this is a long one, but probably the best. An employee is not able to meet the needs of their role, and continuous discipline measures go into effect to help address the concerns. And this is more than likely where it's not known that there is a mental health condition or issue. And sometimes the disability not being known results in the manager potentially becoming frustrated and feels that they're out of options and progressive discipline may be used, possibly up until the point of termination. Mm -hmm. So I think this goes to what we're about to get into, which is a little bit of the training and the cultural development. So let me advance here. Sure. All right. Thanks, Patrick. So um, as, as we mentioned before, mental health, is, mental illness is an invisible um, disorder. And uh, some of the barriers that you, uh, you have raised uh, through, through this poll, it, they're great barriers because um, we've heard of these barriers before. Um, it's a complex issue and involves a variety of diagnosis, treatments, and services. 
Um, so it's important to remember from an employer's perspective that in Ontario, mental health conditions and addictions are recognized as disabilities under the provincial law, including the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act and the Ontario Human Rights Code. So under the Human Rights Code, employers have a legal duty to accommodate people with mental health or addiction issues. So this might mean that employers may need to change their rules, policies, or procedures to create equal access and equal opportunities. And um, going back to what we touched upon a bit earlier is that it's really important for the employer to create a positive and inclusive environment where the employee feels um, safe to disclose their mental health condition. Um, but if the employee is unwilling to disclose their mental health condition, the employer should change the conversation and ask the employer, employee, what do you need? What do you need from me to accommodate you so that you can do your job better? Um, so Patrick, if you go on to the next slide. Um, when you're thinking about removing barriers, I would recommend taking a look at our Think Outside the Box resource. So Think Outside the Box is a free online resource with information and tools and stories about mental health accessibility and disability accommodation. So the infographic you see in front of you goes through nine steps that can help you to improve mental health uh, accessibility in your organization. And you can access Think Outside the Box by visiting thinkoutsidethebox.cbg.ca. Uh, due to time constraints, we can't get into all the steps in detail, but I'll briefly highlight a few of the steps. So the first step is to really focus on the person, not the disability. So uh, it's represented here on the infographic by the magnifying glass. So we might think that if a person has a mental health diagnosis, it'll tell us everything we need to know about a person, but that's not true. Similar to physical health conditions, if a person has cancer, that the cancer doesn't define who they are, and if the cancer doesn't define the extent to which they're still able to contribute. Um, so similarly, if a person has a mental health diagnosis, we don't want to say that the person is depressed or schizophrenic. Um, they can still contribute to the organization in meaningful ways. So from an employer's perspective, what you really need to know is what the person needs in terms of accessibility. So start by creating opportunities for individuals to share their accessibility or accommodation needs. Then consider how you might modify the environment or the activity that's involved, um, not the person. Uh, the last step on the uh, infographic, you'll see uh, the need to partner with individuals with mental health disabilities or organizations that support them. So um, these organizations, community mental health organizations such as CMHA, have invaluable resources and information, and uh, we can work with you um, to improve mental health accessibility in your organization. Well, Kasia, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And I know you're going to be sticking around for the question and answer period at the end. Yes. But let's transition to the second half of our presentation. Karina, thank you for being very patient. Thank you very much. Uh, that said, we've got some tough questions for you today. Okay. Thankfully, you've had some prep time. Yes. That's a good thing. Uh, and not just the last uh, 20 minutes, but several days. Um, let's start with the, probably the toughest one to begin with. Why did the beer store take an interest in promoting workplace mental health? Okay. Um, it, it's sort of a few different areas that we looked at. Um, through the years, we had been doing um, you know, just community support programs, so looking at the Bell um, Let's Talk Day, different things that were happening in the communities, and we're providing information to our employees. We were also doing a lot of information sharing in regards to our EFAP program, but we identified that there were still gaps and uh, things that we needed to do to uh, improve the mental health and mental health awareness of our employees. Um, one of the key focuses was that it's, um, mental health is a, it's a known stigma. So the more we could talk about it at work, have people comfortable talking about it, was not only helping support our employees, but helping support their families um, and uh, their friends as well. So looking at our disability trends, the number one reason that our, um, our internal claims were transitioning to long-term disability was related to mental health uh, conditions. Um, so it was an area that uh, was the right thing to do uh, with our program development. 
but was also a financial impact to us as well because uh, once an employee transitions to long-term disability, the likelihood of a return to work really significantly starts to decrease. Um, and as we were looking at those trends, we were seeing that employees were not getting in to uh, treatment providers early enough. So there were delays in their treatment even starting. And one of the other elements is um, overall supporting our president, uh, Ted Moraz, who sits on the board of directors for Ontario Shores, the uh, Center for Mental Health Sciences. Uh, mental health is an area that he's personally committed to and has supported our program development. And I think that's what every retailer really wants to see from this. And, and with respect to the financial component of it, that's the last of the concerns. The, the greatest is, and, and the priority is, not only the moral and ethical component, but uh, we want to invest in our employees. We know they're going to invest back to us as well, too, if we're giving them a sense of belonging, a culture that supports any issue that they're going through, regardless of whether it's mental health, any other disability, or even life circumstance. Um, from that standpoint, and it's probably very difficult to measure that uh, from an, maybe an employee satisfaction perspective, but have you seen that kind of appreciation from the staff? We've actually received uh, quite a bit of feedback since we initially rolled out our program uh, officially in 2015. Um, and even just in regards to parents being able to have a conversation with their children, because uh, the training that we do, we do talk about um, suicide, recognizing uh, signs and symptoms of um, where someone might be struggling with a mental health condition, how to have those difficult conversations. Uh, we've had people that have brought forward um, personal experiences that uh, they've basically said that you know they were able to identify, personally identify that they were struggling and were able to go and get help. So I don't know that it's something we've been able to measure, um, but it's definitely hearing the feedback and hearing, you know, hearing from uh, a district manager that he, he said that, you know, based on the uh, training that he received, he feels confident that he had saved someone's life. Uh, yeah, and you know, that's probably the most beautiful part of this, that there's a trickle-down effect that's taking place. Absolutely. Okay, question two. What tools, resources, and support does an organization need to promote mental health in the workplace based on your experience? And I know this isn't going to be a complete answer for everyone, but it's to kind of help guide people down that path. Yeah, for sure. Um, there were really a lot of fantastic tools and resources. So I mentioned the uh, EFAP program. Uh, the beer store is with uh, Chappelle FGI for our um, salaried employees. Um, so using those resources, also just looking, there's a lot of really fantastic sort of between Canadian and provincial websites. So we would go and, and look for some of the some of the information and the promotion promotional material that was being released so that we could try and develop our program because we wanted to have something that was very customized um, and something that would speak to our employees. I think another key area was, as I mentioned, our senior leadership support as well as our union leadership. Um, you know, having everyone involved in an understanding of the path that we were going down. Um, the uh, internal training portal, so it's not that there were a lot of, um, we didn't have to sort of recreate the wheel. A lot of the information, and a lot of the statistics are available through uh, CMHA. So we're taking those pieces and sort of making them our own for uh, transitioning that information over to our employees. And I think it's one of the benefits. Uh, there aren't many organizations that are not willing to provide this information relatively freely. It's a little bit like health and safety where uh, we don't want to promote thievery here, but it's the idea of if there's a good piece of information out there that can benefit another organization, why not share it for the betterment of people? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Question three. What was the greatest challenge during the implementation of the national standard on psychological health and safety? Okay. Um, I, I would actually say, honestly, it was where to start. Um, it's it's a very long, you know, working through the standard. Um, it felt like there were between different conferences that we were, I was attending, uh, talking to different people. It was really trying to find how to how to start going down the path. What the best way was to uh, was to start the implementation. So basically, just started with looking at the things we were already doing. So we have a, a fantastic, a robust uh, health and safety program. Uh, return to work program, our disability management programs. So it was looking at the things that we were already doing well and recognizing that there weren't as many gaps to start in the implementation of the CSA standard. So once uh, those areas were identified, it really was just sort of moving forward and uh, starting with sort of the planning 
Um, we did receive um, a commitment from uh, Ted Moraz as well, our, our president, to show his overall commitment to the implementation of the standard because it was released in 2013 as a voluntary standard, but typically when something is voluntary, you've got a bit of a cushion in the window before they, uh, it starts to be uh, something that is it's going to be mandatory. So we thought it was important to uh, start down that path and, and officially started it in 2014. Okay, on to question four. Was there any external vendor that you used to help support this overall process of implementation? Mm -hmm. um, so, as I mentioned, there were several uh, different organizations that we used just broadly for obtaining information and um, gathering some of our information. So, um, we did a rollout of the mental health first aid training for our leadership team, uh, wellness team, and our union executive. That was completed at uh, some Mental Health Commission of Canada training that we used on Ontario Shores uh, to complete that training. So Ontario Shores was a valuable asset to us through that. Again, CMHA, um, the CSA Psychological Health and Safety Standard, as well as our EFAP provider, uh, Chappelle. The development of our internal training, uh, we created a uh, four, it was initially four hours, and we actually, after doing um, about probably about five or six sessions. We've pulled that down to about two hours of training now. And we did utilize the services of Nancy Gowan, uh, Nancy Gowan from Gowan Consulting. So she worked with us to pull sort of all of the pieces and all of the things that we had put together as what we thought was important for us and for the beer store. And Nancy basically helped us pull that into a, a training program. Okay. So two more questions, okay. and I think question five is going to help address some of the questions we have coming in from the audience right now. Fingers crossed. Okay. How did you train your employees on mental health in the workplace and the requirement to accommodate employees with mental health disorders, issues, or conditions mm -hmm. versus any other disability? Okay. Uh, we actually do focus on that in our uh, our training. So. Uh, we did a general e-learning training that was rolled out to all of our uh, all of our employees in January of 2016. But in tandem with that, we actually did roll out a uh, supervisor and manager training. We have spent a lot of time in the past several years um, focusing on return to work, our stay at work programs. So what we were focusing on was when we were launching the mental health training was having supervisors and managers be aware that the uh, requirements of, of the duty to accommodate are the same for a mental health uh, condition as they are for a physical condition. So reminding people that if you have an employee who comes back to work and is looking for an accommodation, we it's you know, everything remains confidential. Uh, we focus on what the employee can do. So having those conversations, and because the supervisors and managers have spent so much time in training around accommodating occupational and non-occupational physical uh, injuries or, or illnesses, having them transition over to that mental health side, we just kept reinforcing that it's the same. We have templates available for them, uh, and having the conversation with the employee focusing on what can they do. And I think it really makes it a lot easier mentally from that standpoint for any supervisor or manager because uh, too often I think it's the panic sets in, how do I address it? So simplification is obviously the yep. easiest way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that reinforcement of, you know, as if you had an employee that was injured at work, you would know what to do. So you know, we're still there as resources, but really trying to get them to have those those conversations and, and looking at what we can do to support our employees to uh, remain at work. Okay. Yeah. Now the last question we have, we've asked of every retailer that's joined us for our webinar series. Um, this isn't to put you on the spot, okay. but what's the best piece of advice you can give to the retailers that are attending today or seeking to promote mental health, maybe that already are, okay. and they're on the way, yeah. or they're at the same point and they're really starting to sharpen up their program, or they're, they're at ground zero and they're trying to figure out where to go. Okay. Um, what would you give to them as the, the best thing you've learned? Okay. Um, so the uh, mental health program and the psychological health and safety standards are large and they might seem like daunting tasks. Um, we started with the mental health first aid training for our senior team and our union executives to show the path we were planning to travel. We needed to sh ensure that everyone was traveling together 
uh, it's, it has been what appears to be a long road, but we've accomplished a lot um, and are really proud of the accomplishments that we've done so far. So I would say my best piece of advice was just to start. Um, it, it really is a find one, one piece that, um, whether it's an e-learning training, something that uh, the retailers know that would work well and would be successful within their own organization and start there. If it's utilizing the EFAP program and services that are already available through EFAP, just, um, you know, I, I think overall my best piece of advice was just to start. I'm going to throw a seventh question on oh, Okay. <laughs> and this may be a little unfair, so I'll try to do, do it gently. We obviously want to always include senior leadership support mm -hmm. at the outset. Um, Is it best just to start, build your team, and move forward, knowing that there probably are going to be some difficulties in the implementation for the benefit of the long-term goal? Not to say that we're not going to have hiccups no matter what, but really you're saying just you got to dive in as long as you have senior management commitment. Yeah, and I think that truly was. Once we, um, we knew that our senior team was committed to um, – the program development, the support, the resources, and, and the path we were going down, we knew that we were able to, to continue moving forward. So. Perfect. Well, thank you for addressing all the tough questions. And I know some of these questions came in from our committee and retailers that have joined these webinars previously. So greatly appreciate it. Um, just for our audience, we are going to take a brief pause as the questions come in for our question and answer feature at the end. But we have posted Kashia Alam's uh, information to contact her at your leisure. Um, please take a moment to write that down. But this will also be made available through the recording of the webinar that will be sent out next week. Additionally, if you have any questions for Karina today, please write them in on the question and answer feature, and we will pose them during our break and start to prepare our responses. So we have a plethora of questions coming in now. Um, uh, let's begin with this. Kashia, we've got a question for you from the audience. Sure. First one being, in addition to what Karina mentioned about uh, tailoring training internally for an organization, are there other training aids that are available for the retailers to utilize when it comes to education on mental health? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, Mental Health Works, uh, and uh, think outside the box. Um, those two are uh, very invaluable resources um, and they can be for any organizations to use. Um, and so the, how Mental Health works is that it's workshops, so we actually come into your organization and the workshops range from one hour to a full day workshop and uh, we train you about basic mental health uh, knowledge as well as what you can do in your workplace to support um, mental health. So mental health works and uh, think outside the box. Those two would be highly recommended. Perfect. Okay, second question is for Karina. Was there a time when the beer store hired a person and the company was not aware that there were mental health issues for that individual, but then found out after the individual was onboarded through their orientation process, and how was the accommodation provided to them? Okay. Um, I think for us, um, I, and I, I think for a, a lot of employers, um, this is still an area that people aren't comfortable disclosing uh, early in the process. Um, they would be, uh, if you have a job applicant, they might be more inclined to disclose that they require um, 
uh, some sort of assistance during the interview process, but definitely uh, looking at mental health issues. I, I would say the majority of um, employees that have been hired had not disclosed uh, that they suffer from mental health uh, conditions during the interview process. So it is something for us that um, it would be part of our accommodation process and our stay at work process. So once an employee is working and it is identified that there are um, uh, some concerns that have been brought forward, looking at obtaining the uh, medical information, having the discussion around the, um, you know, our stay at work program and providing the support and, and resources for that employee. But each one is certainly individualized. Um, one of the things that we did uh, make a note of, and it's actually something we provided during our training, was sometimes an accommodation for someone who suffers from uh, an anxiety or panic attacks, if they're feeling overwhelmed, having an ability to work through a task list. So, you know, sometimes going through the day and, you know, if it's very busy, you know, we're coming into the Christmas season, things get very, very busy. So having someone be able to identify that what they need to do for that day, just to write it down or work with the store manager to write that down on a task list so they don't get lost in the, the busyness of the day and, and get overwhelmed. And I can see that as being a very effective tool to alleviate that potential anxiety that takes place. And uh, as a tack on to this question, I think it's important to remember that the majority of um, the issues that may be seen by a retailer are not necessarily going to be from a new hire. These could be acquired over time, especially for individuals that have a long tenure with an organization. It's possible that this could be along their career journey as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, we have another question, and this is both for Kashia and Karina. Kashia, we'll start with you first. Um, how can we support store employees to effectively support our customers with mental health issues. And I think it's important to preface that an employee may not always know if a customer has a mental health issue. Right. Um, so thanks, Patrick. So um, just like how Karina highlighted throughout her, her talk, I think it really starts by education and training. So education and training um, to store employees about mental health and mental health conditions. And when store employees become aware of mental health conditions and they have the proper knowledge, um, they can avoid reacting in a negative way. They can avoid escalating a situation, and they will be much more understanding if they encounter a customer with some uh, with someone who might be displaying a mental health uh, mental illness symptom. Okay, and Karina, your thoughts? I, I would absolutely, uh, thank you for that, yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, I think in any type of situation where our employees, um, you know, being trained through customer service and having, um, you know, in some cases can be, you know, confrontational um, customers, learning how to diffuse those situations to try not to escalate them. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I don't know that every situation would be related to mental health condition, um, but definitely for our employees uh, being able to be uh, supportive and understanding and trying to uh, de-escalate the, the situation. Okay, we've got a couple more here. Um, Kashi, I think this is going to be directed more towards you. If an employee has a condition coexisting with a mental health issue, as an example, epilepsy, what steps could you take as an employer to successfully integrate the employee into the workplace? That's a really great question. So um, again, going back to some of the training resources um, and tools that have been mentioned throughout the webinar, I think the first step in that specific example is educating yourself about what epilepsy is and um, what are the signs and symptoms and um, sort of learning from there. Um, I think the first step is always just learning about what the condition is and then looking at more of the specific strategies um, to accommodate that individual into the organization. Okay, and, and I'll do a plug from our uh, past webinar, webinar number six with uh, Epilepsy Toronto. It, it would probably be not only wise to, to download and listen to that webinar, but we're happy at Retail Council of Canada to get any of our attendees today in contact with Epilepsy Toronto or uh, Epilepsy Canada with respect to what accommodations could be provided from a job perspective or even from a customer perspective as well too. Um, many times it requires multiple 
stakeholders from an accessibility standpoint if there are concurrent disabilities or disorders that are paired together. Um, but it, it may take multiple organizations to help solve that problem. Um, and, and Kashri, we have another question for you. Um, what are some of the biggest stigmas or negative society perceptions that we still face today in 2016? And how are these starting to be overcome or um, resolved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think one of the biggest stereotypes is that people with mental illness are dangerous and unpredictable. Um, that's not true at all. Uh, the reality is that most people with mental illness they never commit acts of violence, but they're actually more likely to be the victims of violence. Um, another very common one is that people with mental health issues, they have little hope for recovery. But again, the reality is that most people who receive the proper treatment and the proper support, they do improve, um, just like any other physical conditions. They do get better, um, including those with serious conditions, such as bipolar or schizophrenia. So in terms of how these can be overcome, I think one of the common themes throughout this webinar has been the importance of education and training. Um, so it starts with sort of all of us to address these stigmas, to educate ourselves and to learn um, mental health uh, information that is accurate and uh, to really challenge our thinking as well. Um, the media often plays a big role in, in um, escalating these stigma and discrimination for people who suffer from mental illness. So education and critical thinking, I think those two are very important things. I absolutely agree. And two of the, um, two of the stats that uh, I wanted to mention in, in addition to that, uh, that 46% of Canadians think that mental illness is an excuse for poor behavior and personal failings. And the, uh, that one in four Canadians are afraid to be, or be near someone with a serious mental health condition again, sort of perpetuating the, uh, the stigma. And, and you know, there's shocking numbers. I, I've never heard of that before. And I think it probably from the training standpoint, that is gonna open up an individual's eyes quite substantially. Well, ladies, thank you very much, Karina. It's been an absolute pleasure to have the beer store join us today. Thank you very much for your time. Kashi, as always, we, we always welcome the support from the Canadian Mental Health Association. We really appreciate your time as well, too. We know there will probably be a number of questions from our audience directed towards you today. For our attendees, I'd just like to reiterate that we have recorded our webinar and it will be made available early next week for download. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact the Retail Council of Canada at your leisure, and we hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you.